Good evening everyone. Great to see you all here today and I'm about to share some information about two things that I'm very passionate about. Firstly the town of Gawler and of course the second part being a passion for pipe organs and organ music. Um, some people say I'm very organised and other people say I'm just a, a, a little bit uh, eclectic, I suppose, or perhaps part crazy. Perhaps at the end of the night you might be able to decide for yourselves. Well, question, how many pipe organs has Gawler got within the township of Gawler? You tell me. How many? Five. Five. Good guess. And that guess is correct. We have five pipe organs. Now, we haven't always had five pipe organs. There's been a number of instruments that have come and gone over time that reflect quite a diverse heritage in terms of organ sound and in terms of organ style. And I hope that tonight might impart some of that knowledge and, and feeling to you. But firstly, it's worthwhile recognising South Australia as being different to the other states in terms of its organ heritage. You might, for example, go to Sydney and at every little corner you would have extremely large buildings with extremely large organs, even in country scenarios. And that's because mainly of the, the, the uh, more easily collected wealth during those periods as a result of gold and other things. So South Australia's colonial organ origins are a little bit more unique, being the only state to be colonised without convict labour, promising civil liberties and religious tolerances for all as a result. Relative to the Australian eastern states, however, there has not been the degree of population density, industrial activity, gold and mineral wealth, employment opportunity or wages growth. Although South Australia's history is marked by economic hardship in some ways, South Australia has always remained politically innovative and culturally vibrant. And I'm sure some of those elements would resonate with you. So come back to Gawler, the first town outside of Adelaide. St George's was the first uh, church to be built with the first pipe organ outside of Adelaide. And I think it's worthwhile progressing from there. I'll go back and just to be able to highlight the, where we're going with this particular talk. We're going to highlight the five pipe organs we have now, but also the instruments that were in places that are no longer I'll give you an overview of St George's Anglican Church and the three pipe organs that have been there over time. The Congregational Church in Light Square with its very historic Fincherman Hobday organ and a story of intrigue that sees that organ now playing again elsewhere. The Todd Street instrument which is still extant in its original home. The, the organ in Emmanuel Lutheran Church over in Gawler South and 7th Street, the organ here in Zion Lutheran Church, and lastly, we have existing a private residence pipe organ. Every home should have one. <laughs> St George's Church, I did highlight, it's the first main church that had been constructed outside of the city of Adelaide. The building that was first constructed was smaller. It only went up to the beginning of the transept or where the crossing is was added later and the first church was where the nave is currently. It was a much smaller building. They acquired an instrument from J.W. Walker, a very famous London organ building firm in 1853. That's very early for South Australia, very early for any organ building in the state, indeed even Australia. Of course, London was always highly sought after as the preferred place of securing pipe organs of integrity, being uh, the mother uh, 
uh, land of many South Australians, in particular Gawlerites. So J.W. Walker was of course a first choice, being as premier a firm as it is, having uh, a royal warrant at the time. It was a small instrument, it was in the balcony, and it was played with barrels. It didn't have a keyboard, it had three barrels that played in a music box format that gave you a number of tune options. And so you can see, see there a photograph of a similar instrument, not the instrument that was at St George's, but a similar instrument in Port Macquarie, New South Wales. That instrument being constructed in 1855, just two years later, but it would have been very similar. A close-up there of the mechanism in Port Macquarie demonstrates a mechanical intrigue. You can see the little pins sticking out of the barrels, and as, they, as the barrel rotated, like a music box, it would pull down a lever which would engage uh, a, a note to pull down a pallet, let air into a pipe, and the tunes would sound. There were three barrels with 11 tunes each, giving you a total of 33 tunes to learn, nothing more, nothing less. The instrument itself would have been suitable for the size of St George's at the time, but it would have been in part limiting, both in sound output but also in musical output. So eventually, funds were secured to find their second organ, this time built by J.W. Wolfe, an Adelaide organ builder, a Germanic builder in, uh, that immigrated to South Australia, and he was highly, craft, uh, highly qualified in his craft of organ building and was pretty quickly able to uh, uh, take away the fact that we need to engage with London where we can now engage with a builder in Adelaide. I think it's a defining point in time where Adelaide and indeed anywhere in Australia was considered to be appropriate to order such an important item as a pipe organ. Well, the St George's nave was still not com uh, was complete in itself without the crossing, and so the organ was put into the balcony where there's the upstairs seating now. And later on, the organ, when the church was extended with the crossing, the organ was placed in the southern transept. And here in this photo, you can just see on the right-hand side, in about the middle of the photo, the organ just sticking out of the transept, much lower because it was on ground level. Of note here too, you can see that the altar, the original wooden altar with the curtain behind is in place. That altar has now been transferred to the Lady Chapel and the uh, uh, the stone altar is now in place. So this, this photo was very early and indeed is a very important in terms of how the choir within the transept worked with the organ to lead the congregation as a, a key component of what it was to have Anglican worship. Well as soon as the organ was moved to the front with the larger building, uh, the instrument that the wolf organ was, was considered to be too small. Here we have it at the front, again at the lower level, the choir around it. But it's not overly large, as beautiful a sound as it was, it was always considered to be an instrument that required expanding. The organ The organ was purchased as a result of a number of fundraising activities, so there was never a great deal of funds available for this particular instrument. But I think of note is that Mrs. Isabella King left a legacy of £50 for the organ in 1876, and then as a result of raising money through pew rent and seat holding, the vestry was able to secure that particular organ. Well, as a result of it being just a little bit too small and not quite ornate enough, it was decided to rebuild the organ to make it larger. Eventually, a, a, a core group of people from within, the congregation, from within the congregation, a group of volunteers were engaged to activate 
a rebuild of the organ to make it larger, larger to make it louder, to make it more inclusive of the more cathedral sound that St George's was trying to aspire to. So Edgar Bowes was engaged as a result of a committee which was led by Cliff Ayres, and Cliff Ayres being the organist at St George's for over 44 years had a keen interest in enlarging the sound. The rebuild converted the tracker action to tubular medic action and I won't get into the complexities of that, but otherwise it was unsuccessful. The instrument became unreliable, whilst it was still an instrument of beauty, it became uh, a little bit unbalanced in the way the sound presented to the people and it would often break down. So the instrument in that rebuild here at the front was eventually replaced. But I think it's worth reflecting just before we do that the instrument by J.W. Wolfe, there being the nameplate on the organ and a picture of J.W. Wolfe himself, was a beautiful instrument, an instrument of uh, European quality, an instrument built in South Australia, an instrument built in very early times that allowed music to be played with integrity. And that was always the key for St George people. Well, what happened next? Along comes uh, Eric Strange, one of the organists at St George's. Eric Strange was on holiday in London, or in the UK more broadly, and came across his own hometown and discovered an organ that was for sale. An organ that was available, and so Eric decided to work with the vestry to bring that organ to South Australia and erect it in St George's. Eric had the gift of the gab, and also the, the, the feeling of the fingers, and was able to secure that project for and I think I'm going backwards now. There we go. So Eric Strange was able to secure the third organ for St George's, this one being an instrument by W.G. Vowles, a Bristol firm. The instrument was built in 1888 and had been in a number of different places. In, in Bristol it was located firstly at St Matthias Church in Broadveer, Bristol and it was after that relocated in 1970 to St Jude's Church where Eric Strange played it as a young child. So it was a, a reconnecting of player and organ and <coughs> organist and then become an organ transplant of a particular type that brought it to Gawler. Alongside these instruments I also list the organ specifications. Uh, down the side, by way of note, there are a list of the names of the stops or the tones that you can actually gain with this organ. Uh, each instrument is quite specifically different. Each instrument has a different array of stops. Each instrument makes a different sound. But this organ was an instrument of absolute quality. It still is today. With a simple restoration, it would be one of the finer instruments in South Australia. And it's suffering a little bit as a result of old age, as perhaps we all are, including me. But with a little bit of uh, gentle TLC, can regain its early life again with a, a renewed vigour and excitement. Well, the, uh, the instrument certainly has a greater impact in the church. Here we have it pictured with uh, one of the current organists. Um, my writing's too small to read it, so I'll, I'll come to that in a second when I can read it off the screen. Where we can reflect on some of the organists that had otherwise acquainted themselves with the organ seat at the Anglican Church. I think there's a number of notable names here. The first one in the middle uh, being Cliff Ayres, or Ayers. I'm not quite sure of the pronounced Ayres, thank you. Uh, he was there for a total of 44 years of organ playing service and also the person that was responsible for the subjective rebuild of the wolf organ. Uh, also of note is 
Mrs. Hoskins, who was uh, a notable organist. Eric Strange is listed, uh, listed there. Adrian Rogers is the other organist that I couldn't read because it was too small. Lucky for big screens. And currently we, think we have Marie Walling. That, is, that list is not complete, but I think it's a good way to in, initiate some further research into the names of these organists at these places, these music makers, these people involved in this forgotten, often uh, volunteer craft of organ playing, and organ playing that is so important. Question? Uh, Colleen Crouch, it's not spelled right there. But she, that was Ross Creed's cousin. Thank you. Yeah. The, the comment is that Colleen Crouch, spelled incorrectly there, yeah. is Ross Creed's cousin. Yeah. And we'll come to Ross Creed in a second. Well, let's move on. The Congregational Church, just up the road, in Light Square. The Congregational Church had a, an instrument built by, again, an Adelaide organ building firm, which had its genesis in Melbourne from the very famous Fincham firm. George Fincham, the operator of the firm in Melbourne, sent across a, an aspiring young organ builder called Joshua Eustace Dodd, sent him to Adelaide. He joined up with Arthur Hobday to form the firm of uh, Fincham and Hobday to actually build organs for the state and they built 11 instruments. Inside the Congregational Church in 1888 they built a beautiful instrument, a beautiful instrument uh, of one manual that was enlarged to two manual by the same firm in 18, oh, I beg your pardon, the initial instrument was 1885 with one manual, the second manual added in 1888. And here you can see the list of stops on the instrument. There's not many stops, it's a small instrument again, but it was perhaps one of our finer instruments in Gawler at that particular time and would, would have been one of the finer instruments in the state. And I read from the Bunyip at the time, the organ at the former Beg your pardon, read from the Bunyip at the time. The Congregationalists of Gawler have adorned their beautiful church with a pipe organ erected by Messrs Fincham and Hobday of Adelaide. In these days, when so much is said about encouragement to native industry, it is pleasant to discover that there are in our midst enterprising individuals who are striving to localise manufacturers in South Australia. Mrs. Fincham and Hobday are working in this direction and the instrument just open is a testimony to their success. Every part of it, even to the keys, have been manufactured in the colony. The organ is small, one suitable for the size of the church and has been erected at a cost of £200. Not an insignificant investment. It's worthwhile noting that that very first Walker organ in the Anglican Church, St George's, was opened and installed at a cost of, by comparison, £169. So, relatively speaking, that little organ of only five stops with no keyboard, just the barrels, £169 in 1853 would have been an absolute extravagance but a worthy addition to the church. Music making was highly regarded. Here, likewise, the Congregationalists, 200 pounds, and from an Adelaide builder, even without the uh, transport from the UK, uh, a very fine instrument. Well, the, uh, the church and the instrument, uh, the church closed, and I remember hearing this instrument as a very young person, about four years old, but I had a still trapped memory for young memories, uh, even as a small child. Um, by way of contrast, uh, I know that other people might not remember things until they're about uh, four or five or six, but I remember uh, even wearing nappies. <laughs> Having said that, move on. Move on. <laughs> My grandfather, Bert Kaysler, took me into the Gawler Arms Hotel, and I remember running around on the snooker table 
on the Gaula, at the Gawler Arms Hotel wearing nappings. I think he took me in to show me off to all of his friends, but I think it's a beautiful memory. Who can say that they've done that? Well, the church closed, the instrument was sold, and it disappeared off the planet, or so off the records at least, for a good 30 years. And I had always had an interest as to where this organ had gone. I asked Mr. Harding, who lived in Cowton Road, who was uh, an elder, or the equivalent name thereof of the Congregational Church, what happened to the organ? And he says, I can't tell you, it's secret. There was obviously an agreement drawn up where it wasn't uh, revealed. But later on, I, about 30 years later, I received a phone call from Gloria Mack, who by this time lived in Williamstown. And uh, she revealed to me the story at that particular point in time. You know, it's, it's amazing how you wait by the phone for a moment in time where you might just say, ah, I've been waiting for this moment, and it did arrive. The instrument was sold to her husband, uh, who, whose first name I don't recall, but we will call him Mr. Mac, and he had planned to install it in a chapel on his property in Williamstown. The project never come about, the instrument was in storage in a shed. I was invited by Gloria to go out and have a look. Uh, Gloria had always uh, seen me within the organ community and always wanted to make contact, contact with me at some particular point, but it was only after the death of her husband that she felt it was appropriate. The organ was in storage, intact, restorable, and even though it looked so forlorn, had so much promise, and there embarked another organ project to get the instrument back into playing order, but even more importantly, back into a place where it could be enjoyed for its music. So, the Organ Historical Trust secured the instrument, uh, paid a whole lot of costs to have it then advertised, and it was purchased by a very rich uh, property owner in Sydney who owns a mansion called Swift's Mansion at Darling Point. They invested in the instrument with the knowledge that Fincham and Hobday had the most incredible sound with the most incredible potential and, in, and installed this, this instrument into their mansion. Uh, I got to assist with the playing of it at, the, at its opening only about five years ago. Uh, perhaps six years ago in 2016 when it was restored by Northern <coughs> organ builder Hargraves Pipe Organs. There is the nameplate of the instrument and underneath we have a picture of one of the organ builders, J.E. Dodd, not Fincham or Hobday, but the person within the firm that did all the work, J.E. Dodd. We'll come back to him in a sec. As you can see, this instrument is very Victorian in terms of its colours and ornate decoration. It is a beautifully restrained example of its type. It has gold mouths, uh, would, would have been 24 karat gold leaf and that's been reinstated. And I think of note is the instrument, whilst it's very small, still actually packs a punch. The top is a, cop, uh, is a picture of the Swiss mansion and below is a uh, 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 a photo of the installation within the mansion itself. And I'm going to go a little bit technical here. We're going inside this particular organ because it is uh, one of just such beauty in terms of organ building. The pipes that you see on the right hand side are all spotted metal. That's highly prized. It's by spotted metal, uh, I'll get a bit technical, it's a mixture of tin and lead, the equivalent of what's otherwise pewter. All organ pipes are made of either uh, pewter, a mixture of tin and lead, or zinc, or wood. And here we have them made of the Rolls Royce of all materials, spot of metal with beautifully large spots. Um, the spots are, de uh, are derived into the metal as it cools as a result of the balance or the uh, mixtures of what's otherwise the tin and the lead. It's part of the crystallisation process. Then on the left we can see the stop knobs, the beautifully engraved with Victorian scripts, uh, maybe a little bit too small for you to see, 
but you can see the names of the stops on the instrument. The first letter in red and the black to follow. All very Victorian, all very orthodox, very beautiful, the overall being a very satisfactory sound. Coming back to the Congregational Church, what about some of the organists? And all of these have been researched by various people that I know and offered to me uh, for presentation here. I'd love to know more about the organists at the Congregational Church. Perhaps of note is Mrs. Corton, who had 11 years of service. Uh, there are many others there I'd love to know more about. I do notice that there are two Davies that are subjectively brothers. Ross Dawkins was an organist there in the 1970s prior to the church closing. Again, important people in the music and uh, the music making life of Gawler and are often forgotten. The next church, we have Todd Street Uniting. Uh, Todd Street was one of the churches that perhaps had the most money, one of the churches that perhaps had the most influence, one of the churches that had uh, the better organists along the way. The inst instrument within Todd Street was built in 1925 by the Adelaide firm again of W.L. Roberts. There again you can see the stop list of the original organ and of note, just note the number of lines which tells you the number of stops. W.L. Roberts uh, learnt their craft again in Victoria and transferred to Adelaide and built a number of instruments in Adelaide. I can tell you that their style of organ tone is more romantic, more symphonic, more like a liqueur port than a sparkling charade. <laughs> and if you can taste that, then you can hear the sound. By comparison, the instrument that we just saw, the Finchman Hobda at the Congregational Church, would have been a little bit more like a, a, a Cabernet charade. And the instrument by J.W. Wolfe, the very the second one within the Anglican Church would have been more European in its format and would have had more the sparkling Shiraz tonality. So within the wine series you can tell the organ's sound. Well, the instrument as a result of just the uh, enthusiasm of the congregation has been enlarged numerously over the years. So observe how many lines are there in the original organ and now see how many lines are there for the current organ. And it's almost double in size, but also we get to be a part of an instrument that is quite diverse, an instrument that actually has so many places to go with organ playing. Uh, it's, it's very easy to play as a result. Whatever you pull out makes beautiful music. And I might ask the maestro on the CD player to uh, stoke up the... <laughs> the organ sound here where we will play one minute of sound. This is played by Gavin Riggs and it's track number 20. While we're finding that, it's worth noting a number of our organists at Todd Street. There's two pages of organists here. This has been thoroughly researched and provided to me by Gavin.
go. Uh, a little bit underwhelming today, but when you get to go there and hear it in real life, it certainly packs a punch. It's an instrument of uh, a great beauty. Let's reflect just for a few moments on some of these organists. Some of these names are actually very professional uh, musicians in their own right, and some of them have gone on to be musicians in other places. I'll only reflect on a few that I know of uh, from this particular list. I know that the organist, the organist of Blake Mortimer, uh, went on to be the organist, uh, of, uh, was previously, I should say, previously the organist at Cape Town Methodist Church. So there's a history that has come to the Methodist Church as a result of previous organ playing. Theo Mitchell, the was there from 1934 to 1937, went on to be the organist at Painter Methodist Church uh, for approximately 23 years. Kathleen Watts, their maiden name was I, uh, who was the granddaughter of the 1920s church choir master uh, A.O. Dawkins, a formidable name within the town of Gawler. Uh, the Dawkins uh, the Dawkins went on to have two, two generations of choir conductors that ruled, the, uh, ruled with an iron fist in terms of their choir conducting. Uh, this being the, the older, A.O. Dawkins. Kathleen becomes sub-organist at St. Peter's Cathedral in the 1940s. Uh, what a wonderful way to go. Kathleen also played down at Mount Gambier in her old age, and well into her 90s, produced her first CD. And I've heard her playing, and it's still full of uh, vim and vigour. It's full of just incredible musicality. What a beautiful player, what a beautiful lady. And it's also very rare to have a lady organist in this otherwise male-dominated world of organ playing. Um, I note further down we have Colin Curtis in 1952. Uh, and within the 1950s played. Colin later became the organist and choir master at Perry Street Methodist Church in Adelaide City, a highly respected choir conductor at Pembroke College in Adelaide for many years and also organist at Church the Epiphany in Crathers. Doesn't stop there. We have Ross Krieg, who was mentioned before. Ross Krieg uh, was organist there uh, for various services. He also played at the Lutheran Church and would have been Lutheran down to his bootstraps, but would have still come to the Methodist Church to play as a result of uh, A, the organ, but B, the capacity to play good music. Ross starred as organist in the ABC TV film centred around pipe organs in the Barossa Valley. He moved to Queensland as a music teacher later on. Uh, at St. Peter's Lutheran College in Indooroopilly. That film that he starred in was uh, produced in 1861 by the ABC and uh, through the Orkin Historical Trust of Australia we've actually put it to DVD. And it's a beautiful snapshot. It's a bit of a fictional documentary of the organs of the Barossa Valley and uh, uh, highlights a number of the instruments there. Uh, another history night we can talk about that. Well. Keeble Duffield was organist there uh, for numerous years, off and on for 40 years, and of course Gavin Riggs, the formidable Gavin Riggs, beautiful musician, trained so highly and so enthusiastic in his trade, and he was organist there for a total of 35 years as well. The names go on. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning at the bottom that Adele Weebush taught the pipe organ at Todd Street, and a number of the organists of Gawler use Todd Street as the basis for their learning. How good does it get? It doesn't get much better. Let's move on. The next organ. This one is at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Gawler South. I note the building here. At the, uh, in terms of architecture, the architecture of Emmanuel Lutheran Church was the very famous German uh, immigrant architect, Eric von Schramick. He built a number of, uh, or architected a number of churches, mainly for the Lutheran Church, but also denomina other denominations, including Morn Church. Yeah, if you remember Morn Church in the city, which was the 5AA uh, broadcast centre, the most beautiful building in Adelaide, destroyed only recently. Uh, but here we have one of his 
I think more interesting examples in Gawler South. Let's not forget architecture, and I think another talk for another day in terms of modern architecture, which is becoming the history of tomorrow. Well, the instrument here wasn't installed at the start, like most places have had a harmonium. The instrument that come here come in 1974. The instrument was originally installed at Dale Street Methodist Church in Port Adelaide. So this is the church in Port Adelaide in Dale Street. But the church has subsequently been torn down to be replaced by supermarkets in the town centre of Port Adelaide. Uh, it's so unfortunate what we've lost over time. It's a huge building. Just look at the, uh, the way that it just points to the sky and just keeps on going. Uh, the organ inside is at the front, uh, dwarfed by the building itself. It's not a small organ, but it's still dwarfed. Look, at, you can just see the outline of the shapes at the front. It's got uh, two towers of fives in the centre, flat of pipes, a, a total of uh, 23 pipes altogether. And look at the stop list, it's still quite a significant instrument. Uh, as the church was uh, uh, torn down, the instrument was removed, and as uh, the Lutherans and Gordon were looking for a pipe organ, it was installed there in 1974 in the balcony at the rear of the church with the case remodelled. Uh, there inside too, note the architecture of Eric von Schramick. It really packs a punch of modernistic style, and uh, I, I think it's very worthy. I remember first hearing the pipe organ in 1974 when I was only just a, a little kid, again my still trap memory. I don't remember any of the music played, but I remember being able to feel the sound in your seat for the first time, very different to the harmonium. The case of the instrument was covered in speaker cloth until 1996 where Gordon Koch a local uh, craftsman in timber recreated the case in a European format, utilising the space available, available upstairs with a flying V formation. And it's funny how the instrument sounds better when it looks better. Uh, I think it's, it's a, a worthwhile addition uh, here. The mention of Gordon's name associated with the, this organ is synonymous with the builder, the builder here being Frederick Taylor. Frederick Taylor was again a Melbourne organ builder that learned from George Fincham where all of these other organ builders started. He came to Adelaide, oh, he, he built an organ for Adelaide, he came to Adelaide only later on, but the organ he built for the Dale Street Methodist Church was in 1912. The same year as the Titanic set sail, uh, the Titanic's long gone, but this organ still lives. At Emmanuel Lutheran Church School, there are a number of organists that are here again, mainly associated with the pipe organ. We have Rhonda Schultz, uh, who played there for a long time, a spinster that dedicated her life to organ playing. Uh, a number of other names that you would recognise in more modern times. Uh, I myself uh, play there today as well. Well, second to last organ, nearly there. The Zion Lutheran Church uh, in the building just across the way here was without a pipe organ for quite a long time. It had a, an amplified reed organ there, played by Philip Nowick for as long as I can remember. Just like the Dawkins ruled the choirs with a iron fist, so did Philip Nowick with the organ. Uh, he had a particular style of playing that I, I think back now and I go, goodness, did I hear that? Uh, but it, he, he led well. Um, the instrument for Zion come from the Emmaus Uniting Church, or the Methodist Church at a particular point in time in Clarence Park relocated to Zion Gawler in 1995. There you can see the stop list. It is, a, it is an instrument of a different style yet again, this one being very symphonic. 
and if I was to relate this to a particular wine style, it's more than just a, a fortified wine. It is a fortified wine which perhaps might have a lot of age to it. It's very chocolatey. Uh, it's a blanket of sound that is built up in layers that give you a very flat but very broad response. You can feel it in your seat. That instrument is still there today and serves uh, uh, and plays well. I think it's also worth noting that it was built in 1946 by J.E. Dodden's Sons, which soon uh, amalgamated uh, in the 1940s as a result of the Second World War with the firm of Gunstar Organ Works. J.E. Dodd, of course, was the builder of the Finchman Hob Day in the Congregational Church. Here in the firm that had progressed to the next level, the style had moved on to the symphonic style and he appears here again as one of the creators of this instrument. He died shortly after this instrument was built. Materials were hard to find at the construction of this instrument, so even the case pipes with its zinc pipes were cast in about two or three lots because it was hard to get zinc of any quality, yet alone any length. Some, hits. Some organists here include Philip Nowick and a number of other people that still, uh, uh, that, uh, still play elsewhere, including uh, Judy Spencer, who's my co-organist within the Gordon Lutheran Church. Well, the last organ here, the very end of our talk, and here we have a house organ. This instrument was built in 1974 by J.E. Dodd, Gunstars and Sons, except this time in 1974. The style had moved on again. This instrument has a wonderfully crackling sound, a beautifully uh, triangulated format of uh, chorus work. Uh, it's a pleasure to play. It's in my home. It's the instrument I have in my house. It was built originally by, uh, for the home of Olga Nitschke, who had it commissioned for her home at Lily Farm, at the top of Krondorf Road in the Barossa Valley. You go up to Krondorf winery turn left and go through that little ford crossing with all the lilies. She lived there just to the left and had this beautiful instrument installed there. Um, the instrument uh, uh, was sold to me and it still lives there today. I think today's talk has highlighted a range of instruments in a range of different uh, places, different liturgical styles, different traditions, but the music is one thing that perhaps unites all of these buildings and all of these different uh, uh, organs. Organ music is one of those synonymous things that whatever language you play it in, uh, whatever history you are associated with, you have the capacity to just enjoy good music. And in summary, there's the instruments again, the three at St George's, the Congregational Church, Todd Street, Emmanuel Zion and the Residence Organ. And we have five of them still extant here in this little town. Actually, that's not many for a town the size of Gawler. And I highlight perhaps that the Barossa Valley, with a population of just over 20,000 people spread across a much larger area, has 25 pipe organs. 25 pipe organs. Uh, it's a, an even more organised community than Gawler. <laughs> Well, two small pieces of inspiration just to wake you up. Uh, the first from Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart who said about pipe organs, to my eyes and ears the organ will ever be the king of instruments. So true. And I think the last saying and the last word goes to Johann Sebastian Bach who said that there is nothing to organ and nothing to playing the organ. You only have to hit the right notes at the right time and the instrument plays itself. <laughs> I hope that you've enjoyed just a potted history of the organs of Gaul. They're not too technical, uh, a little bit more social, but it's, that, it's very dear to my heart that these instruments are a part of a community. It's true that an organ without a community is, is a folly. It's an expensive piece of furniture that's, that, that, uh, that doesn't really have a part. But when it plays music, and even more so music within a community like we have here in Gawler, it has so much more meaning 
uh, so much more presence and so much more history. Thanks for your time and enthusiasm tonight. Oh. And lastly, we will play a little piece of music. Yes. Uh, like, while you're thinking of your tricky questions, we'll play a piece of music and I will uh, uh, fill any question you like. I, I hope that you will stop me, but I don't think you will. And here we have track number 17. This is the organ at Emmanuel Lutheran Church played by me. That one. It's a beautiful light and vibrant sound. by the London firm of William Hill and Son for the Adelaide Town Hall. Much larger instrument, three manuals and 37 stops. Uh, one of uh, Hill and Son being the most important organ builder in London, indeed in the world at the time, that built instruments all around the world and even for uh, town halls within Australia. Highly regarded, which suffered a number of modernisations over the years, like the Wolf Organ at St George's, saw it degraded and down, uh, become unreliable put into storage, but it's now being restored back to its original specification and built in the Barossa Regional Gallery by the Auckland Historical Trust of Australia. Back to Hill and Son, back to the original 
uh, uh, instrument and sound, and is now one of the more highly prized instruments of its type in the world. Do you know what happened to the Regent Theatre organ? What happened to the Regent Theatre organ? The wonderful Knight Barnett with those programs on radio, Melody Land, right up until the 1950s. Uh, the Regent Theatre installed a Wurlitzer into uh, the theatre, imported from America with much fanfare in 1927 to accompany silent movies. Uh, in 1928, along come the talkies, and so the instrument suffered a slow, un, um, uh, a sense of unloved, unwantedness from there on. But it was still used uh, to play for intermission for many years after that in those radio programs, which is synonymous to uh, what we would still recognise as just great fun. Instrument, when the region was downgraded to those smaller uh, theatres, was placed into the, uh, the Assembly Hall of St Peter's College in Hackney Road. It's still there today, still in original condition and still a, a remarkable example of 1920s organ building. Uh, uh, right at the back was first. Louise, could you say a few sentences about this organ builder called Lemke? Daniel Heinrich Lemke. He was a single guy living a bit north of here, not from a big company, but on his own, who I think built four organs in the Bronx Valley, but you would know far more. Yes, Daniel Heinrich Lemke is uh, uh, an organ builder that immigrated uh, from the larger Germany of the time to the Barossa and with him brought a trade which was probably more of a craft that he, had, he was expert in. He wasn't an organ builder as such but he built such beautiful instruments, small instruments, one manual, only four stops, you'd only see four lines in a stop list, but instruments that were built here in South Australia with South Australian materials in the uh, 1840s, 50s and 60s, but were built in the style of uh, the middle of Europe, which was the this, this centre of music making as was known in the world at that particular time, after the style of Gottfried Zilberman, would you believe? So here we have some uh, remarkable uh, instruments, as I say, built here, that don't even exist in Germany anymore because he was building in an old-fashioned style that has only now just become to be so highly prized. The fourth of his instruments, which was a light pass, was eventually moved around to a number of different churches. At last ended up in Frankston in Victoria, of all the places, and has just recently found its way back to South Australia as a result of the Organ Historical Trust of Australia back to light pass. What a win. Isn't the pipe organ at Rosedale Church? It's a quaint little organ. A quaint little organ. The instrument there was built by uh, Samuel Moorman. He was a bit of a crafty person. Uh, as an organ, he, he had a number of fires in his factory, probably for insurance purposes more than <laughs> fire purpose. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's one of the main instruments uh, that's extant from his output. Uh, all of the pipes are made of wood. And it's still a very beautiful instrument of its type. It still has that very poppy, Germanic quality that's very different to English organ building. I forget the date of the build, but forgive me for that. Over there. Yeah. Um, I haven't got a question, but I, uh, I do remember the bells of uh, the Methodist Church ringing on Sunday. It was a beautiful sound. And you had the bells ringing Saturday for the, for the weddings as well. But there was always a downside because we lived right next door to the Methodist Church <laughs> and they had practice on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So there was ups and downs on the, in that area. But it was beautiful music in the summer. Yes. Um, many of these churches had weekday services and then mm -hmm. they had services in the morning and at night and, uh, and the bells wouldn't have stopped. You're right. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Tom? Yeah. Ben. Steve, <laughs> where did the organ in which country? Uh, the, the organ has been around longer than you think. Uh, it was uh, first invented by the Greeks. It was called a hydrolysis and it used uh, a series of water balancing uh, elements to provide a constant wind supply to a series of pipes. Um, 
In many ways, it was also used a, a, as a type of thing that would be dragged down to the battlefield to play loud sounds to scare away the opposition, as were the bagpipes. And so the organ quickly had a reputation of filling large buildings with large sound, and from the very first uh, uh, millennium, soon progressed, well, not soon, but over, over time progressed to be uh, the instrument that it is today. It really had, a, had its climax within, in numerous ways during the mid-1800s in terms of organ design. And it's really perfected at, that, at about that particular point. Mechanism still gets perfected further. The organ that was Theatre, is it still there? Yes, it is. The organ at the Capri Theatre was originally installed in Victoria. Uh, the Capri never had an organ originally, but uh, the theatre itself was purchased by the Theatre Organ of South Australia, Theatre Organ Society of South Australia. They secured this instrument after it had been sold a few times from a man in Darwin, and they removed it, brought it to South Australia. Two weeks later, uh, Cyclone Tracy devastated Darwin, and they got the organ out just in time. And you find it there now. It's actually a more complete and a more exciting example of the Wurlitz organ here in Australia. Uh, it's, it's a really good example of its type. With the Capri organ, such an experience to sit and feel the music was such to. Yeah, the difference with the Capri organ, and I'll now relate it back to the. Hillam's son that was in the Adelaide Town Hall. The Adelaide Town Hall organ was the first of what's otherwise Adelaide's concert organs. That's different to a church organ. The concert organ was meant to be big, grand, full of character, but full of big sound to actually entertain you and to fill you with just all sorts of warm, tickly tones that, uh, that are hard to get these days. The theatre organ was about 50 years on again where they had lush, non-reverberant theatres so they upped the pressures, made the sound louder, and induced the pressure wave, which gives you the uh, synonymous one, 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 one effect that uh, just, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a bit of a naughty sort of sound in its own way, and tickles you in a different way in, the, in that sense. Steve, in all your experience of organ playing, what do you have a particular favourite, or do you love them all? Organs are like people. They all have something to say, believe you me. Uh, some of them have more to say than others. Uh, it's also true that if you listen carefully, every organ has something nice to say. And then it's a, it's a matter of how, as an organist, you can caress the personality out of the organ. Um, it's also true that each organ will reflect their organ builder, and you can hear the sounds of the organ builder uh, come across uh, at every time. At what age did you get involved in learning, studying? Oh, I, I fell into it. All organists start out playing the piano. I learned the piano from Frieda Nowak, uh, who, uh, who probably taught a number of uh, piano students here in Gawler, and I fell into the organ. Uh, probably as a result of hearing, or better still, feeling that sound in my seat in 1974 at Emmanuel. Organs. When I came out in 1961, I went into Adelaide to the cinemas. Now, the powers of the earth became the organ and the organist. Were they church organists who were moved like actually into theatres, or were they definitely defined church organists and theatre, or did they cross boundaries? They crossed boundaries. Uh, the question was about do theatre organists also play in churches? Quite often, yes. And it's even been said that the best church organists are those that have part-time jobs playing in bands or things like that, or the theatre organ, because all of a sudden um, the whole thing of engaging with an audience and tempo and rhythm is also important. Uh, sometimes that's missing in church organ music. So therefore the best church organ music are those that have otherwise this moonlighting uh, alter ego personality. <laughs> Okay, as you agree, that's been a really, really good night. Yeah. Now, normally what I do, I circulate before the meeting to try and uh, ask individuals to come up and do a vote of thanks. And they love it when I come around and tap them on the shoulder. Now, tonight, there's a person who actually begged me to come up here. 
by the name of Terry Craig. Now, I actually lied because I strong-armed him into doing this, because <laughs> I know a lot of people don't like coming up and making a fool of themselves, and I do it every month, so it's fair that we share this around. So to give a vote of thanks, I'll ask Terry to say the right words. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. I really enjoyed that, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll say a bit more about that in a minute, Stephen. But just to introduce myself, and the first time I've ever been to the Gaul of History thing, someone comes up to me and asks me to do a vote of thanks. <laughs> Incredible. Great chairman. I thought that, I'll give him another job. Um, so I'm a member of, of Gaul Lutheran Church, the same as Stephen, and uh, I was, I've grown up in this church. I was baptised in the church just across here in 1954. And that was the same year that this uh, this hall was built. So um, I try to tell people that was 39 years ago, but I, I don't think it is. Um, I'm also um, chairman of um, the centenary celebration. So on April the 10th, um, we're celebrating the centenary of the building here. So take your minds back to 1921. Lutherans had been worshipping in the Gaula area since about the 1850s, but in 1908 they formed a congregation just across the road in what was called the Little Glory Methodist Church. And they were growing fast, so they decided they needed to have a, a new church. And they bought this land here, it was an orange orchard, and in September 1921 they picked the lowest tender. You ought to work with Germans, they, 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 they like to pick the lowest tender every time. Anyway, they picked these guys called um, Roland, Roel and Rody, I think they were, from, from Udunda. And they were, must have been fantastic builders because in October 1921, so September we issued the tender, October 1921 that the stone was dedicated and in April 22 they uh, opened the church. Now, I reckon we should get those guys back to help with the uh, Gaul electrification. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Anyway, that day was very special and um, uh, there were 1,500 people uh, worshipped here. There was a service in German and a service in English. And after that they fed 1,200 people um, and it was reported in the Advertiser, the Chronicle and the Bunyip as a, uh, the building was fantastic and the hospitality of the German, the German Lutherans was, uh, was incredible. So, Stephen talked a lot about organs tonight. Now, I don't, I'm an electrical engineer and I work in the power industry. And um, in 1994 or 1995, my father said to me, I'll oh, come and help us shift an organ from down in Adelaide to here. And Stephen's going to be there. And I, had, I think I had much to do with you before then, but we did, did there. Anyway, an organ, there's different types of organs, and Stephen didn't talk about this, but this one here has a, a lot of electrical cables. And when I say a lot, there are thousands. And we had to disconnect all the cables and cut them and label them and bring them up here and resold them. And we soldered thousands and thousands of cables. And I, look, I, ha I have to work from circuit diagrams. There was no circuit diagrams. And Stephen said, well, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. We'll get it all back together. And sure enough, we did, and that sounded fantastic. My uh, second experience with this particular organ, I'll always remember, I was an elder in the congregation here. And now and again, the, uh, the organ here uh, has a little idiosyncrasies. And, one of the pipes was making a, a noise, and everybody's sitting here just like you, and this pipe's making a noise. And I knew from Stephen that you had to put a little piece of paper under the uh, under the valve. So we uh, pushed the big pipe up. You imagine the big pipe sitting here, and and uh, about to get the uh, piece of paper in there, and it kind of unhooked at the top, and this thing was starting to come over here, and the whole congregation went ah. But anyway, we got through that. But uh, anyway, look. What I'm up here here is to give a vote of thanks, and I'd like to thank you, Stephen, for a very interesting talk. I know you're a dedicated man and passionate about what you do, and it comes across. And uh, I really congratulate you on your talk, and thank you for your time tonight. It's fantastic. Okay, thanks again, thanks for doing the public, thanks for that.